So you're telling me that we destroy biodiversity, we prohibit animals from going near our lawns, we put up don't step on the grass signs and we spend countless resources and hours maintaining it and we get nothing in return. Why are we still doing this? Hello everybody and welcome back to my channel. My name is Gitty Mary and today we are talking about lawns and the impact of lawns. It might not seem as a big topic, but actually there's a lot to dive into here. Before we get into the environmental impact, I really want to go over some of the history about the lawn. It might not seem exciting to everyone, but honestly, this part is my favorite part of my job. <laughs> The idea of the lawn originates from the Renaissance in the 16th century. Here, lawns were cultivated by the wealthy in France and England. However, lawns were not planted with grass at first, but rather with an assortment of smaller plants like thyme and chamomile. The word lawn stems from the Middle English word lond, which originally referred to an opening in the woods free of trees. Early examples of the lawn were made around castles that gave the guards a clear view of enemies that might be approaching. The more closely cut grass lawns that we know more of today originated around the 17th century in England, France and Scotland. The closely cut grass lawn was a clear sign of wealth because it required a lot of resources to maintain it. Mind you, there wasn't really any machinery to help people do this, so all the lawn maintenance were done by hand. The sign of wealth also came from the notion that you could show other people that you could spare this entire land to do nothing and you didn't require everything to be made into fields to grow crops. Opulence. <laughs> Immigrants from Europe to North America brought with them not only the idea of the lawn but also the seeds to plant them. And around this time the lawn also became more widespread because we developed machinery that could help us due to the industrialization. In the US and Canada, lawns were used as bowling greens both in Virginia and Boston, where they actually grew bowling greens way before 1650. Another big spot that furthered the introduction of the lawn was golf, which came from Scotland. The first courses in North America were established in Montreal in 1873 and in Quebec in 1875. The first US golf course was built in New York in 1888. And fun fact about the US Golf Association, they had a huge influence between 1910 and 1924 as they funded research with the US Department of Agriculture about the ideal ways to cultivate grass, which ultimately led to the widespread availability of the American lawn. But there's another reason why the lawn became more widespread, apart from golf the suburbs, because during the mid-19th century, cities became bigger and more industrialized. More and more factories and corporate buildings started popping up, and as a result, city planning started introducing urban beautification. And this was how the park was born. The concept of the American park was actually inspired by British estate grounds with shrubbery, fountains, ponds, and landscaped lawns. From parks being introduced in major big cities, it didn't take long for the concept of the backyard to become a stable. And with the suburbs spreading and backyard spreading, so did tons of different innovations that could help us maintain our lawns. One of them being more and more effective lawn mowers, but more importantly, consumers started buying pesticides and herbicides to maintain their lawns. And it's during this era in the suburbs that the idea of the weed-free lawn became the standard. See, lawns had all kinds of small, closely cut flowers and shrubbery in them all up until the 1950s. Clover, for instance, was only categorized as a weed in the 1950s because one of the more widely available broadleaf herbicides that became available at this time accidentally killed it alongside with the dandelion. So the company started using these weeds in their advertising because they knew most consumers had them present in their lawn. It is indeed the create a problem, create a solution in a nutshell. Who thought that the idea of grass could be grossly exploited by capitalism? Now let's get into the environmental impact of the lawn. One of the issues with the lawn right off the bat is the amount of space it takes up. It's a lot. In the US, lawns cover more than 50 million acres of land. When including parks and golf courses, the collected land mass is equal to that of Maine, New Hampshire, Vermont and Massachusetts combined. According to a NASA study, lawns take up 2% of all of the US, which is three times more than irrigated corn. And at least like we get something from corn, you know. <laughs> with the lawns, there's absolutely no product no yield, 
Nothing! Yes, this annoys me very much, thank you. Then there's also the notion that a lot of homeowners end up planting exotic and invasive species. And second to deforestation, invasive species is a huge threat to biodiversity. Some of these invasive species include Irish ivy, Japanese and Chinese wisteria, as well as decorative trees like the princess tree, the Bradford pear or mimosa. When maintaining a lawn, it's also not uncommon to rake leaves and grass clippings, put them in a plastic bag and throw them away often to landfill, where they will never ever biodegrade. However, garden waste would be great in a compost, or even better, leaving it on the lawn could help spark biodiversity. Microorganisms and insects live in falling leaves and grass clippings, and when removing them, you're removing a vital part of an ecosystem. Lawns also require massive amounts of water, especially so in places where the lawn wouldn't thrive naturally. And I mean, arguably, the lawn is not a natural phenomenon and thus wouldn't necessarily thrive in any environment. But you catch my drift, right? Every year, the US use about 3 trillion gallons of water maintaining lawns. An average lawn cannot simply be maintained simply by rainwater. And as a result, about one third of all consumed residential water goes towards lawns. Let that sink in, pun intended. This comes out to about 7 billion gallons of water a day. This is a huge problem and it will be even more so in the future because only 1% of all global fresh water is available to humans. And with increasing climate changes, water resources are decreasing in many areas. So using this amount of a finite resource on a lawn I don't know about you guys, but this seems deeply unethical. Now, you wouldn't think that fossil fuels had anything to do with lawns. Or like, maybe you would, I don't know your life. Anyway, it does. The majority of lawnmowers today run on gas. And as a result, 2 million gallons of gas is used to keep lawns neat in the US every year. In 2011, a study found that 26.7 million tons of pollutants were emitted by landscaping machinery. And the worst thing about this is that most landscaping machinery have little to no pollution control, which makes them dirtier than cars. So I would strongly advise against riding your lawnmower to work. Keeping your lawn nature free also requires some harsh chemicals and about 70 million pounds of pesticides are used on lawns in the US every year. And of course, using both synthetic fertilizers, pesticides and herbicides come with some dire consequences for biodiversity, aquatic environments, as well as for water and soil quality. All for a green lawn. Expanding on this, you could also definitely argue that lawns have an almost homogenizing effect. Just think about it for a second. They make neighborhoods, areas, cities all over the world look completely alike. So from that angle, you could definitely also argue that lawns have some aspect of cultural erasure. Some time ago, I read a piece that was both interesting, but most of all, just absolutely terrifying about how neighborhoods that are predominantly black in the US have less urban beautification, have less trees, parks, lawns, grass, etc. because from a sitting planning perspective, it just hasn't been prioritized. In contrast, neighborhoods that inhabited mostly white citizens included lots of parks and trees and grass, etc. urban beautification. And as a result, these areas were a lot more pleasant to be in, not only visually, but also in terms of summer heat. Black neighborhoods, because there isn't any trees or grass, do have a tendency to be two to three degrees hotter in summer on average, which comes with some pretty dire consequences. There's also the notion that lawns definitely still maintains its historic ties to wealth. Global resorts, and again, golf is definitely involved here, turning indigenous growth forests into recreational spaces where predominantly white wealthy tourists can practice their best swing. Today, the lawn symbolizes a form of stability and order and similarity to the extent that lawns are mandatory in many communities. That is, it's against community guidelines to grow anything but grass in certain areas Areas, and that is an outdated and deeply unsustainable practice. But let's talk a little bit about the alternatives to lawns or how to make your lawn more sustainable. In areas that are prone to drought and in d d d d d overall in areas, turn towards more native vegetation to plant in your yard rather than just grass. If you live in an area that is prone to drought, stuff like succulents might be a much better option because you don't need to water them as much, nearly. You can also use gravel and rocks or moss even to make for a more sustainable and much more usable space. Or wildflowers, 
Shrubs and trees also have a much higher carbon capturing ability and native species of plants will also increase biodiversity. We want this. Also, and this is quite a statement that I'm really there for, but just leave your lawn be. Let nature reclaim the space. That will mean you will have higher grass that you can maintain in one way or another or not maintain it at all. And just let nature run its course. Lawns are just dead zones because nothing can really thrive in a lawn. So if you want to start out by doing something, start out by making some designated zones. No mow zones. Like don't mow these specific areas in your lawn. If leaving all of it be seems like something that's a little out of your reach or something that is perhaps not possible where you live, going 50-50 on it might be a good idea. Again, also just using half the space to plant wildflowers or native vegetation that will increase biodiversity. Or lastly, do something with this space that actually ends up benefiting you back and biodiversity and all these other things. But plant a garden. It doesn't even have to be like this big project that now I'm a farmer. Okay. There are tons of plants that require very little maintenance and you will get something back. And that's really where we want to go, I guess, using these spaces to create something that will benefit us and our community. And the more food you grow in your home or near your home, you won't have to go out and buy and support big agriculture, which is also something that has a huge impact on the environment. So growing things locally, depending on the season as to what you're growing, I cannot stress enough how purposeful and beneficial this would be. And with that, that's the video. Thank you so much for watching. I hope that you liked it. If you have any tips, as to what you can do with your lawn to make it more sustainable, leave it down below. I would love to read it and I guess a lot of people would too. Thank you so much for watching. Please remember to like up this video and subscribe. And if you're already subscribed, please turn on notifications because YouTube have been known to not show my subscribers my videos, which is a little heartbreaking now that you have subscribed, you know? So let's help each other out with them. Like, I don't know, help, help me out mostly, but like, what can you do? Hustle or a hustle. Thank you so much for watching. Have an amazing day and I will see you guys next time. Bye. Thank you so much for watching this video and also a special thank you to my Patreon supporters. You guys help me create green zero waste contents and I love you guys. You can find the links to my social media accounts down below and the link to my Patreon on this screen. Bye.